What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapali here, hailing to you from the Money Smart Casa here during the last point in life. Here with NFL player, Notre Dame standout, D tackle number 97, Chris Zorch, national champion. Yes, sir. Since then, since his day. But uh, Chris, how you doing, brother? W welcome to this uh, Cigars with MSG. Kind of wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm assuming we're, we're going to do a little cheers. I mean, where's you got a backup? Oh, Man, a, now we got to. How you bring in, How you can have a party and and, and and not have the alcohol pour? <laughs> is that Uncle Remus? This is Uncle Nearest. Oh, Uncle Nearest, dude. Hold on, hold on. Well, you got you got a bottle. <laughs> Come on, baby. I'm a neat guy. How, how, do, you, how do you guys? How do you guys take your? Uh, how do you guys take your whiskey? I'm, I'm a neat guy. That's what I'm talking about, baby. Look at you. You know the story, right? Well, of course, bro. I'm an investor. I'm an investor. Listen, I didn't know that. Yeah. See, the more you... Oh, if that's the case then, man, you need to give me a little discount. <laughs> Come on now. I'll take a couple of cases from you. But, but, but with that being said, talk to me about it. What is your understanding about the story of this, of this, of this amazing whiskey? Well, I know that. Cheers. Cheers, bro. Yes, sir. Absolutely. My man. Cheers. Are you drinking a drink? Bro. Uh -huh. Just like that. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, can I ask what you're smoking before we get started? I am smoking for you. I broke out a special one. Uh-oh, watch out. As, uh, there's a, uh, I know somewhat about cigars, but when these guys started talking about cigars, like, what are you guys talking about? I'm smoking a Byron Reserva. Nice. Okay. It comes in a, it comes in a, doesn't come in a box. It comes in like a, like a, a round, like a vase. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a reusable, definitely reusable. That, that sounds very impressive. <laughs> um, For you, I don't have a vase. And I, mine. I am actually uh, going to smoke a CDO flathead, a 70. Yeah. Yes. First of all, uh, not a CBO, I'm sorry, CAO. Anything CAO makes is, is perfect. Yeah. Perfect anyway, so. I'm a brand, I'm, I'm gonna I'm cut mine too as well here as well. Yes, sir. I'm cutting Sorry, this crazy. Sounds like we're on a little date here. All right, so now, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what you got lighted with, but I may have you beat, I don't know. I got, I got a little torch here, bro. I mean, oh, you got a torch. My bad. You might have me. You might have me. Watch out. Hold up. I got oh, an snap. Instagram. I, I got to Instagram this. You got it. You got oh, it. You got like a straight up blowtorch over there. Here we go. You don't get the propane in, in, the, in the cigar? It is the coolest thing. I saw this. There was a guy who was smoking cigars in his garage about 10 years ago. And I, I asked for light. And he pulled out a, I was like, man, what are you doing? He's like, watch. And I'm, he would, I was like, oh my God, I went to Home Depot the next day and bought a setup. It, basically all it is, it's just a, a uh, it's a plumber's uh, setup with, with the propane. And I didn't even know what you call this thing, but I mean, I know how to use it, but there you go. So and it's my lighter in the garage. <laughs> oh man, I, uh, I, uh, Sometimes I have you ever used those pine the the strips? You oh, like the strips? Love them. Yeah. Do that too as well. It takes a while. Right. Right. And have you ever if I could, I would use match actual stick matches all the time. Cause it just gives a whole different taste and everything else. But you know, it takes all day, you know. So and then I have an everyday smoke that I wanted to show you. This is a, this is a, a Schizo Maduro. Schizo Maduro. It's so. These are awesome. They're almost like, I want to say maybe four or five bucks. Great smoke. And I smoke on my motorcycle. Oh, really? I saw your kind of background, but I, I don't have one of those, but I got it. Believe. Oh, you got, you got some, one, you got some babies in the garage. Oh, I got some so when I'm riding, I enjoy smoking. So these are great on the bike, and it's a great everyday smoke. 
Four or five bucks, that's not bad. It's awesome, awesome. How do you spell that? Uh, S-C-H-I-Z-O. Schizo. Schizo. Yep, Schizo. it's just Maduro. Got it. Like I said, four or five bucks. I like uh, smoking the six, um, the 660s, which are great. Um, they be walking around with, with the skinny cigar. You know how that is. So I like the size of yours as well. Chris, how'd you get involved smoking cigars, bro? What, what, what uh, turned you on so to So this occurred when I was with the Bears. I got drafted in 1991, second round. It was awesome. It was a great experience. Woo! I had the draft now. I mean, just with uh, the pandemic, it's been kind of challenging. But it was just a great – it was an amazing experience. And I was – That was 90 – 91. 91. And, you know, after the offseason – Everybody's kind of hanging out downtown. And if anybody knows the Chicago area, the place to be in the 90s was Viagra Triangle. <laughs> it's right over there in the Gold Coast area. Yeah, yeah. So I will, for those folks who may not know what Viagra Triangle means, basically it was all these rich old dudes picking up these young, hopefully 21, 23-year-old chicks. Sugar babies. And there's this place called Jillies. Yes. I'm out there all the time. Yes. And at the time, you could smoke indoors. It was awesome. And enjoyed it. My first cigar there and never stopped. So that was 1991, the summer of 91. Wow. The summer of 92, sorry. Wow. How about you? We're, we're just, uh, well, I, uh, cigar story. I, uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, Warren Officer Navarrete, he's from Peru. And uh, he'd always be out in the back, you know, after a mission, smoking a cigar, planning meetings, smoking some cigar, you know, and um, he'd encourage us, you guys come back, you guys come back healthy, safe, alive from a patrol. You guys come back with no, no mishaps, we'll smoke a cigar. We fought for that cigar, man. We fought, that improved our morale. That's awesome. And when was that? This is uh, this was uh, this was uh, this was ninety one. This is ninety one. Okay. So I was I was eighteen years old in the in the. Oh, Marine. you're a baby. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was eighteen years old in ninety one. You got drafted into NFL in ninety one. I went to Persian Gulf War in ninety one, and um, ninety two we went to Operation Restore up in Somalia, Africa, and then wow. we did a couple a couple things there. So before I was like twenty years old, I was like in two already two two conflicts already. But this would keep me going. Cigars would keep me going. That's amazing. Right. And, and so when I came back, when I got the Marine Corps and, and uh, I went to go get some cigars, I said, uh, this is the cigar. I went to the cigar shop. These are the cigars that Warren Officer Navarrete, he, uh, he'd have a smoke. He said, what was the name of it? I think it's called Padron. He goes, oh, right here. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And he goes, dude, he had you smoking like the Mercedes Benz, Bentley, Exactly. Full body cigars. Like, yeah, why? They're like 28 bucks a stick. I'm like, wow. This guy was like dumping. He cared for you guys that much. Yeah. I'm like, so, you know, I'm in business. I'm making a little bit of money, right? And so the, the Padron brothers were having a cigar event. I'm pretty sure you've been to the titles, right? And, and the Padron brothers are, are, are part of the event, like $150 a ticket to get in, 200 bucks, dinner, whatever. And you get a, um, like four pack of cigars. Okay. And so like, you know what? Can I get another? I'll buy another one from you guys. I had the Padron brothers autograph the box. Oh, nice. And I sent it to him in Afghanistan. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so a great we, story, we still, man. We still catch up. So Warren's officer, Navarrete, separate double dog. Thank you for turning There you go, up. man. <laughs> and I guess I could say this again. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you for support and everybody that's out there, man. Yeah. So that era of you being in the 91 Chicago Bears, what, where would you say the Bears were at in terms of team? Because 85 Super Bowl champs, you, you, uh, you, you came off a championship in college. Has Notre Dame won a championship since then? Unfortunately not. Yeah, that's it. You're the last, you're the last national championship champions for. Which was 30-something years ago, which, again, it's, it's embarrassing, actually. Lou Holtz, man. Lou Holtz. Yes. The, myth, the man, the myth, the legend. For him to go to the, the, the Gamecock or the, the Gamecocks, right? South Carolina. Yeah. Yep. And him 
you know, what was it like playing for a coach like that? It was, it was amazing. Uh, I met him my the end of my junior year. Did he recruit you? And it will, pardon me? Did he recruit you? Uh, yes, yeah. Wow. So it was interesting because there was a, a junior day, a junior high school day that he was hosting at Notre Dame. And I remember going down there, this was at the end of my junior year, and he got me fired up about doing homework. He got me fired up by doing homework. I mean, really? I this dude would, would, would do with me if I actually played for him. So he, fast forward a year, I was uh, kind of fortunate enough to get a scholarship. But the kind of interesting story, before I even went down, um, there was an assistant coach that was recruiting me. And, right. And his name was uh, Marty Schottenheimer. And so we went, oh, I'm sorry, his name was Kurt Schottenheimer. We, we went down uh, in my high school coach's basement. We we're talking, and he was like, How would you like to attend the University of Notre Dame? So I've never even heard of Notre Dame before, right? So I was like, I would love to, but my mom doesn't like to fly. Now, as a reference, I grew up in Chicago. Chicago's 90 miles away from South Bend, Indiana, where Notre Dame is. My high school, Chicago. Okay. High school is right off of the Skyway. So literally, it's probably like 84 miles from Notre Dame, exactly. Away from all the traffic. Exactly. But I told him, my mom doesn't like to fly, so she would never come see me. He was like, what do you mean? And he was like, well, and I said, I told him, well, Notre Dame is in France, right? And he was like, what? And I was like, well, you guys got the hunchback guy. Oh, I just said hunchback. Man, he looked at me and he went on, he went to the file. What's your SAT score? Do you know? <laughs> I mean, he was he was very shocked. He was shocked. Play defense. <laughs> hey man, exactly. I had no idea. But I say that to say that no one in my neighborhood growing up ever went to college. No one in my neighborhood, it was a big deal if they graduated from high school. Like we had parties when people graduated from high school. So it was a big deal then. But I mean, you know, there were maybe, I'd say maybe five or 10% dads in the household. You know, some of you, it was just a really uh, neighbor, very poor. Um, so no one went to college. And so I wanted to grow up to be either fireman or an auto mechanic. And nothing against those careers, but those are the only things I knew in my neighborhood. And I never saw a person carry a briefcase to work before. So for me, I just knew what I, I just knew what I saw. Yep. That was basically the firehouse that was a couple blocks away. Mm -hmm. And the guy who ran the mechanic shop was another couple blocks away. So the guy looked at me and was like, no, we're about 90 miles. He, I was like, what, what, really? And so he gave me all this information. And I went home and was like, hey, mom, mom, look, this school's interested in me, blah, blah, blah. And then obviously after that, I, I kind of dove right into the, the Notre Dame lore and wound up, who knew that I was going to become part of that legendary program so wow what a story anybody in your neighborhood ever go to a big program nope no nope. i was only, i mean i mean we had people that went to community colleges in the area but you know those were single moms were like 30 40 years old i mean it was, yeah. it was just kind of that type of environment like no one really went to school amazing amazing so how did you get exposure to how did you get exposure was it picking the right high school it was your exposure it was a stepping stone to because because for me, I went, to, I went to high school in Cicero, uh, Berwyn, Cicero area called Morton. And there was, yeah. there, was, uh, there was no, I mean, the, co the coaches really had no desire to, they had no connections. They had no network. There was no, like, I'd never know about a camp. Wow. You'd find out about players who go to college going to camps. We never went to camp. Our camp was summer job. Well, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I totally understand that. Actually, surprisingly, um, start telling all these stories now. Here we go to my senior season, uh, it was the summer. Um, high school. Right, correct. And my high school coach kind of pulled me aside and was like, you know, you have some pretty, pretty nice schools interested in you. You need to dedicate yourself to working out and being in the weight room, getting in shape. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, you, you need to take the summer and just train. And at the time, every summer, 
that I was able to work, I worked for, and I forgot the name of the program, but it was a city job. And you basically like picked up garbage in the neighborhood or you helped out a local community center or something like that. But unfortunately I made about maybe about 2,500 bucks or maybe $2,000. And I gave that to my mom to kind of help us out throughout the year. Wow. Like we really needed that. Over right? the summer. We were on public aid and, and it, was, it was just, we were really poor. So I had to sit down and talk to her and said, you know, mom, you know, this might be a really good investment for me to not do the summer job so I could train and get in shape and, and, and hopefully impress some schools where they can give me a college or excuse me, a scholarship. So, you know, we, we kind of thought about it. We talked about it and we talked about the money. She said, Hey, it's going to be kind of tight. It already was tight, but it's going to be a little bit more tight. Yeah. But she said, yeah, because she knew that getting out of the area would, would be a great thing. Wow. So yeah. I talked to my high school football coach. And so he wound up getting me a membership at the YMCA in South Chicago for $50. We had 50 bucks. It was, I think, for like three months or something like that. And I trained there every day for like four hours. I swam, I jumped, I jumped rope, I did everything, ran, I did everything. How big were you in high school? Uh, my max is about 225. Really? In high school? Yeah. Uh huh. I mean, I was a big fat kid, so you know, I had to lose all that weight. But going into my senior year, I mean, we didn't test body fat, but I was, I was really lean and had a chance to get some scholarships, you know? So my final five visits or my final five offers were the University of Miami, who had just won a national championship. Oh. Um, in, it was actually 187. Um, University of Illinois, Michigan, Northwestern, and then Notre Dame. That's a big, that's a big names recruiting you. Yeah, I was lucky, but, but here's the thing though, you know, so, we had to do without that $2,000. And I mean, it was, so my, my mom got like about 180 bucks or 160 bucks from, from public aid every month. And our rent was 140. And I told you how big I was in high school. So you can imagine how much I was eating. Yeah. 40, 30, 40 bucks left over. is not a lot to feed me, let alone her. Right. You know, so it was, it was kind of rough. I mean, you know, sometimes at the end of the month, there wasn't food. Um, I could remember there was a jewel in my old neighborhood, and when they would close, uh, me and my mom would go there, and I remember this as a little kid, like six or seven, she used to pick me up and put me in the dumpster, and we used to take food out of there. And it was kind of interesting because I kind of joke about this, but as a kid growing up, I never knew that apples were round. Because when we, when we got them out of, the, uh, out of the garbage, they had like the brown spots and stuff. So my mom would cut those off and she would give them to me. So any apple I saw, you know, I mean, I see my TV, but any apple I physically saw was all cut up and stuff. So I kind of joked, about, joked around and said that apples are square. <laughs> so well, you can imagine in that environment that the money that we, that, that we had throughout the, the year, we needed. And so yeah. that $2,000 I made over the summer, I mean, that, did, that really hurt us. But, you know, you fast forward several a year, and I was able to get a college scholarship. So, You know, that, that's really something that we can translate to today when we're in a pandemic, we're in a lockdown. A lot of people haven't got a paycheck in a month, five weeks, six weeks. They're looking for apples that are looking square. Eating top no ramen. You know, oh, like yeah. growing up, it was eggs and rice. You know, it's uh, all the time spaghetti, the, and then the generic spaghetti. The, the box sure. said pasta. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Uh, I, well, the ones we had, they came in a white box with like a right. green label. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. All yeah. All these are something like that. But you made you made the most of it. You you, you fought through it. And uh, bro, I was I was telling you when I first met met you. The, I think it was uh, 88, 89, but obviously you obviously would know this, but you, got, you guys just came back from the Orange Bowl. And um, I remember reading a, a story in the newspaper sometimes, and I put it up on my wall in my bedroom to inspire me about the, the, just, the, the, just the story of you winning a championship and sadly your mother passing away when you came home. And I just, I, I was telling myself, I, I couldn't imagine this situation. And yet, you still had a level head. You still went forward. And the character of you 
fighting through all that, uh, that adversity. I, I just couldn't imagine what a young man is feeling and what you would go through right now. I think right now during a time of loss where people aren't getting things where they want to go and sadly people are losing their life to this invisible enemy. What, what, what advice would you give somebody to, to go through adversity and, and loss of a loved one that's so close to you? Any thoughts, any guidance? Sure. I mean, the, the only way I made it through was the support of my friends and family. And, and here's the kicker. So when she passed away, I got over 5,000 cards from people I'd never even met before. Little wow. kids sending me like 50 cents, like their allowance. Um, in the mail, literally in the mail. In the mail. Literally in the mail. Wow. I got a letter from George Bush, who was the president at that time. Wow. Um, you know, he was like, hey, I'm hit. And that was, I mean, I was blown away by that. And that really encouraged me because you got to realize it was me and my mom for, yeah. my, for, for my whole life. And when you take that away, I never had a dad. You know, I had some male role models eventually later on, like my high school football coach, things like that. But as a whole, you know, there was male around. Yeah. It was just me and her. And yeah. so you take that away, you're lost. And I was. And, but I knew that all the sacrifices that she made, so I'm, I told you I was, it was a rough neighborhood. Well, she used to get mugged a lot. People would bring them to our apartment and stuff like that. So it was really rough. And I fought so hard to create an opportunity for her. And she passed away in January of 91. And I got drafted in uh, April of 91. Hmm. So I didn't even have a chance to kind of get her out of there. But in her honor, I was able to start a foundation and help a whole bunch of people. But it, it was really hard. And so the advice I would have is just, you know, going through this rough time, you think it's hard. I mean, my coach always told me, tough times don't last, but tough people do. Mm. And that is, and I think about the sacrifices my mom made just for the simple thing. So we didn't have a car. So in order for her to get groceries at the, at the store, she'd get on her bike, go to the store, put the, put, put the food in her basket. But we could only eat as much, or she could only get as much as she could fit in the basket. And sometimes people would mug her, knock her off her bike, and take her groceries. So sometimes we get home and she was like, we don't have any groceries for today. Wow. You know, playing that to a seven, eight year old kid, right? Hungry. Those, the sacrifices that this basically, for me, an, an everyday hero that my mom was, right? So I learned sacrifices way before I, I met a coach named Luke Holtz, way before I met a coach named Mike Ditka. So although I learned a lot from them, I mean, I was coming from a place where I didn't have food sometimes. So, you know, you think a game is hard or you think fourth, fourth down is hard, man, you know, try going to bed the third or fourth night in a row with, you know, your stomach growing. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So you, know, you have to think about the, the sacrifices that your friends and family made. And if not for those individuals, I mean, I was 21 years old, and all I knew was my mom, and she was taken away from me at, at that age. And so I, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But I knew I had to graduate because she would have beat the crap out of me if I didn't graduate. And if I had a chance to get drafted, hey, that's fine. But I went to Notre Dame not because it was a great football program. I went to Notre Dame because they graduated 98.98% of their athletes. Wow. So, going there, I was going to be guaranteed a degree. Yes. I don't know what the hell I was going to do with that degree, but I heard that if you get a degree from college, then you can get a better job. So I'm in. Yep. But that's how basic it was for me. Yep. So it was just really about survival, right? It was about, and, and, and Holtz always used W-I-N, win for an, for an acronym, which was what's for the W-I important and now with the end. Yeah. And when you think about that, so we had a, our first team meeting, I'm a freshman, 
And I mean, he had all this set up because the seniors already knew all the stuff. And then everybody else did, but the freshmen didn't. And so first meeting, he said, what, what do we want to do? Show me a raise of hands. What's our goal? Of course, seniors, juniors, sophomores, they didn't raise their hand. Freshmen like, oh, what a national champion. What a national We want to do we want to win a national championship. He was like, no. We were all like, what? He's like, we have to have a good practice today. We were like, huh? We don't have a championship. He's like, no. You have to, so then he wrote win. He said, in order to win, you got to take care of the fundamentals. You got to take care of what's important now. And at that time, you can't win a national championship if you have a bad practice today. You have to work on that every day. You have to work on that to become better. And that's why it's great because people always talk about how, how hard it was for us in practice. So when we got to the game, it was easy. And that's, that's exactly it. But if you don't practice well, you don't perform well. Yeah. If you got some huge God-given talent like a uh, Rocket Ishmael or or uh, Tony Rice or Tim Brown, or you know uh, Troy Aikman, I mean whoever you want to name, Tom Brady, you may not have to work that hard. But for the rest of us, you have to work hard in practice, and so you have to work hard in those fundamentals. And so you're talking about the basics of football. You're talking about baby steps in order to be successful. So for us to win a national championship one year and lose one game the following year, mm. it was about those fundamentals. It was about making sure that we knew how to tackle. It was making sure that we knew how to run a good route. It was, it was, we had to make sure we had to do those fundamentals in order for us to be successful. And when you concentrate on those, you are successful. And then that, again, it's, it's, it's a, um, a metaphor for life. You have to take care, take care of the little things in order for the, for the big things to happen. And I don't care what job you have, you have to learn the basics. I don't care what position you hold. You have to make sure that you can be successful. In order to do that, you have to know what the hell you're doing. But everybody thinks sports is easy. We just make it easy. No one knows about how hard the practices are. No one knows that our shoulders, our knees, our backs are aching. But on game day, you know, hey, oh, this is great. Yeah. And I'm a fan, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Hey, go, go team, go. But, you know, they don't know how hard it is for you in practice. You know, you know, Brandon Marshall said something during the draft. Because, you know, it was kind of a weird, it was the virtual, the, the virtual draft this year. Right. And um, uh, uh, he said something pretty profound. <laughs> they were raising money for all the, uh, they were raising money for all the uh, first responders. And he said, uh, a lot of those first responders are sitting there, they're on their feet all day, 12, 14 hour shifts. They're losing uh, uh, weight, they're losing energy, they're losing nutrition. And so one thing about uh, professional athletes is that we don't necessarily get, it's not about getting ready for the next game, it's the recovery to get to the next practice, right? Sure. And so, so how, how is that? When, when your body doesn't feel right, you got homework to do, you got responsibilities. You know, people today, I think, forget that you see athletes, you see professionals, you see them on TV, but there's a whole lot of discipline. When, when I saw Tom Brady amongst his peers on the NFL draft, just, a, you know, he's bantering and, and having a good time. You can just tell there's a certain level of discipline between him and everybody else, right? Sure. There's, a different, there's a discipline between him and uh, Neon Dion and everybody else. I'm sure there's a certain level of discipline with you and everybody else. I mean, do, you, do, your, do your friends or the people that you um, – connect with and never played sports, do, 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 they, do they have like a disconnect about how really disciplined your life needs to be if you want to play at the top of your game, whether it be sports or business? It's sure. dis and, but it's the same thing like you with friends who have never been in the military. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and by no means am I comparing military to sports, by any means. But it's that discipline where it can be sure, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. You're practicing, you're practicing the rain, you're, you're doing stuff that no one even could imagine your body going through. But that end result is you get to come back after a mission, right? It's those fundamentals you learned in basic training. It's the fundamentals you learned two, three years ago, way back when, that folks don't know about. So it's the same thing, right? So it's the same 
reaction that I'm sure it's the same reaction you have when you hear people, oh, military, oh, the service, you know, whatever, whatever. And you kind of shake your head and like, you have no idea. You just have no idea. And it takes a different type of person in order to be successful. You know, I'm sure the person you went to basic training with, I mean, you didn't know that person. And either one, you be he became your friend or she became your friend or that person didn't make it. And it's the same thing in life, right? I mean, you, you're gonna have, and I don't wanna say only the strong survive, but when you're looking at the success of a professional athlete, you just don't show up one day and start catching balls. <laughs> Tom Brady, as much as, as great as Tom Brady is, he can walk in there day one and start throwing balls. Six round. Right. So he went, he practiced fundamentals. He does, it's the stuff you don't see him do after practice every day. Yeah. Michael Jordan, right? Greatest athlete to ever play any game, right? No one sees him making his thousand jump shots, or excuse me, his, his thousand layups, his thousand free throws before he leaves the gym. Other guys on the team, oh man, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and go to this party. I'm gonna go ahead and do this. MJ sitting there shooting free throws. What? But that's how the greats become great. You think Muhammad Ali mm. didn't, didn't spar hard, didn't do this, didn't do that? Are you kidding me? I mean, it, it's, it's that level of discipline when you're a great athlete that puts you over the top, right? And so for a person like me who wasn't that talented, I had to work hard. So I had to spend that time in the gym. I had to spend that time when guys are going out and partying. Here's a perfect example. I got terrible grades my first semester at school. I didn't know how to juggle this. First of all, I went to a public school in Chicago, which wasn't great. Then you send me to Notre Dame, and I'm like, what? <laughs> this is the hardest semester of my life. But it taught me a great lesson. I got a couple of, um, I was on academic probation for two classes. They sent a notice home to my mom. My mom got a mail and said, what is this? And I was like, look, it's too hard. I'm ready to come home. Wow. Like, why? And I was like, man, it's just too hard. I can't do this. It's like, why not? What do you want to come to? I said, mom, you're there. It's like, I'm not going to be here forever. You have an opportunity no one in this family ever had. Wow. You have, you have an opportunity no one in this neighborhood ever had. So why won't you make those sacrifices? Well, I was trying to be like everybody else. I was going out, hanging out with my friends, not doing homework, going late for class, trying to be cool. Well, they were held a lot smarter than I was. They went to a better school than I did. So I had to button down. Those guys were going out, hanging out. I was in study hall. I had to do homework. I had to do, and I'm not saying I was an A student. I got A's and B's. But the idea of trying to, trying to hang out with your buddies when they had, again, going back to fundamentals, they had better fundamentals than I they went to private school. They went, they went to great schools, and I didn't. Yeah. So it's a little harder. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of the guys I came in with as freshmen, I graduated in four years. Those guys may have taken five or six years to graduate. Yet they went to better schools. And I'm not saying I'm better than them, but I had to have that discipline to work harder because it didn't come quickly to me. Because I, I just didn't. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not smart. Yep. I didn't have those fundamentals, and those fundamentals were, was going to a good school, having that opportunity. And so that's why I admire college athletes so much, because they have to sacrifice. I mean, it's a full-time job. I don't care what – it could be golf. It could be um, crew. It could be lacrosse. Whatever sport it is, you have to train. You have to sacrifice. So some of those nights when you're – people in the dorm, your buddies, your girlfriends, your boyfriends, whatever, are all partying, you're working. Now, I'm not saying you do it every day, but you're making sacrifices that folks don't know about. All they know is what happens on the court, in between the lines, in the field, whatever it is. They don't understand the sacrifices that athletes make. And so that's why it was so hard to see that the NCAA said that they aren't going to have any spring sports. And these kids train forever for these opportunities. And I'm not saying they're going to go on to the next level. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the 
woman on the field hockey team. She's not gonna go pro. Yeah. But she worked as hard as the kid who just got drafted. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So why shouldn't she have that opportunity? Well, that's what just broke my heart that these athletes weren't able to compete in the spring. Right, because of the because of the uh, pandemic, the lockdown. Right. Great. That's a great point that you that you just mentioned there. Yeah. The the the, the conversation I because you know you know we we coach new entrepreneurs. We we usher them into the insurance industry. We coach people how to start their own business, and and they see the, the glitz, the glam, the opportunity to come in and make a lot of money, but they don't want to be disciplined. I, 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 it just doesn't translate to me. And to try to explain that to some folks, you know, sometimes it's an area of frustration. I mean, there, there's a guy today, you know, he's, a, he's an electrician, good, smart, got a job. But I, I want to make 100 grand a year. How are you going to do that? But yet he doesn't, and, and he, but he's looking at it. Can you help me? I can help you. He goes through materials. No, I don't want to do it. Quit. Right, right on the spot. I'm like, okay, you know. So let's, let's talk about quitters. The guys that were in, that you had in sports, right? The guys that made, like, the way I look at it, you either make winning a habit or you make quitting a habit. Right, but, but and, and I, I agree with that, but, but how do you learn that, right? You don't come out the womb uh, yeah. knowing quitter and winner, right? You don't, right? right. So, so where do you learn that from? That's the thing, right? And so, I mean, and, and I'm not, I don't have an answer for that, but, 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 that, that's what, what, what happens. You're formed as a young kid. I mean, I didn't, know, I didn't play organized sports until I got to high school. Mm. I, did not, I did not put a pair of shoulder pads on until I went to high school. People, people can't believe that. They're like, oh my God, you, we have to know the name. I didn't start playing until I was a sophomore in high school. Wow. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? But it was hard work. And I had to learn this winning attitude. Yeah. Learn that. Just like you had to, right? I mean, you didn't come out the wind and say, hey, I'm going to win, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Yep. Yeah. And, and it was those experience, those life experiences that you had that made you have a winning attitude. So here's a perfect example. When I went to the Bears, so we had to, we had won a national championship. We we won, we lost one game the following year. We lost three games my senior. I mean, I was winning is what we did. Yep. Back to the Bears. First game I was on the Bears, we lost. And I was in the locker, I was like, oh man, you know, head down and everything. The guy came up to me and said, what's up? It was a veteran and I was like, man, we lost. He's like, dude, man, get just a shot, man. I'm gonna take you to this party. I was like, what? Wait, wait, what do you mean we lost? He's like, man, this ain't Notre Dame, kid dress, let's go. Wow. And I'm not saying that guy didn't want to win. Yeah. But the whole psych for me, it changed. It was a business now. Okay. Now, that could be good and bad, right? But for me, I enjoyed playing for the guy next to me. I enjoyed because I, I wanted to be part of a team. I didn't have any brothers and sisters. It was me and my mom. My friends are, are my brothers, right? My friends are my sisters, right? So for me, I love that team aspect. And so I love playing for my teammates. Now I get to the Bears, hometown team. Yep. Go shuffle, Mike Singletary, all this other stuff. Wait a minute, what? He's like, man, we get the same paycheck if we win or lose. And it just blew me away. And I was like, wow. Like, it took, although I had a great year, I had a great run. I played seven years. I had a great time. But at that moment, it changed for me. Because I was no longer playing for my teammates. I was playing to get a check. Okay. So it was different. And I'm not saying that that's the same for everybody. But for me, winning was important. So I had to make, I made those sacrifices in order to succeed. And we practiced hard during the week. And then when we lost, people had the same attitude as if we won. I was like, well, I'm not used to this. Like, I don't know, I don't know what losing is. I lost like just a handful of times. Yeah. This. And so when, when you mention, and, and that's a really good point, right? But it's how do you create, how do you embed yourself? How do you learn about this winning culture, this winning attitude? And it takes time. I mean, you just don't swallow a pill and say, hey, I'm a winner. Yeah. Okay. You have to go through some adversity. You got to lose some games. 
They get the crap beat out. That's why I love football so much. I love sports in general. I was an athletic director at a Division I school. I love athletics. But it's something about football because you get the crap beat out. I don't care if you are Tom Brady. Some days Tom Brady, some, sometimes Tom Brady has a bad day. Yeah, of course. Sometimes Tiger Wood has a bad day, right? But in football, especially on that line, you're not winning every play. So you get the crap beat out of you one play. You get the crap beat out of you in one game. You lose that game. You got to bounce back. You got to brush that off because now you have to practice for the next opponent. Or more importantly, if you get beat during a game, you got to brush that off because the next play, you might make a play. Yeah. So winning, in order to be a successful winner, you have to know how to lose. I know that sounds crazy, but you have to know bad in order to be good. And so your greatest winners, I think, have lost in their life, right? So, for example, the uh, I forgot the quarterback at Clemson, the current quarterback at Clemson, forgot his name, but the first game he lost in his high school and college career was last year when LSU beat them for the national championship. L- long hair, long hair guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's great. But I guarantee you he's going to have a great year next year because yeah. he knows that feeling, right? He was so close. But where did he learn that? I mean, he learned that in grade school. He learned how to be successful. I guarantee he just didn't walk on that field every day and they won a game. They, he practiced hard. He was out there throwing when, no other, when nobody else was throwing. He was, you know, the old school when, when, you, when you tied a, a tire and a rope to a tree. Sure. He, he probably did that. I mean, he probably got, you know, machine. But it was, it's that, it's, it's making those things that no one sees, right? So if people talk about what makes the great great. And I truly believe it's what you do when nobody sees you, right? That's how character is built. What happens when people are, what do you do when people are, are you taking a shortcut? Because eventually, that's going to catch up to you, eventually. Yep. Take a shortcut when no one's looking. Come on. Yeah. What, what is success? And, and that's why I love that the quote. We talk about what do you do when no one's looking? And so, you know, what do winners do when no one's look? They they're practicing. You think Jordan? Would, I mean, look, he got. I mean, we're, everybody's watching the Last Dance, right? Of course. You found he was cut his sophomore year from the varsity team, right? You don't think he went back and practiced hard? I mean, his mom even said that. Harder, harder. He came back balling, a starter. And look what happens. And, and but people just see him, you know, as Michael Michael Jordan, but. I want, to, I want to see what Michael Jordan did when, when, when no one was around. I want to see him in a, pra- in, a, in, a, in, in a practice facility when no one's there. You know, how many free throws is he making? Right. Now, okay. and I'm sure a lot of people did that. But, you know, after, you know, you get a group of six guys afterward, you know, a couple minutes later, and I got five. All right, man, I'm gone. And I got four. Who's the last one? You knew Jordan was. <laughs> so, Chris, uh, at the college level, I'm, I'm just curious. At the college level, you have so many stud players around you. you, you, you like you mentioned earlier, you got Rice. You, know, you got Brown, Rocket. Obviously, you got you. What player in your collegiate career made the biggest impression on you that made you want to work harder? And, 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 and why did they make you want to work harder? Who would you say that would be? Um, I would probably have, there was an offensive lineman who was a fifth year senior when I was a sophomore. His name was uh, Chuck Lanza. And I would have to go up against him every day in practice. And he beat the crap out of me. (laughs) But I learned so much from him because he was an All-American. And I had a chance to practice against the best. And so my freshman year, I practiced against him, never played a down my freshman year in college. Never played a down. And, but I knew in practice, I would give him hell. 
Now, I may not be a perfect nose guard, and he, he could beat the crap out of me, but there's some plays that I would get him. And then I started my sophomore year on, but it was because of him. Wow. Because I learned, because he beat the crap out of me. Every day, I had to go against him every day. I was lucky that I had a chance to go against an All-American every day, even though he beat the crap out of me. Because when I knew it was my turn, I don't care, anybody you, you put in front of me couldn't be any better than the guy that I practice with against every day. So for me, his name is Chuck Lanza. And I really feel that, you know, if not for his ability, I wouldn't be the, I wouldn't be the player I was in college. Amazing. What would you say, what would you say about uh, Lou Holtz? What, what would you say he, did, he made an impression upon you? What did he press upon you that made you to play your, the play that you became? Well, he taught me the fundamentals, how, how fundamentals are important. Okay. And I, I talked to you about, I, I knew what sacrifice was. I knew what hard work was. But I didn't put the hard work with the fundamentals, right? So I just assumed, okay, well, you know, you, you get a scholarship in their aim, you're a good player. Well, he's like, okay, now we have to teach you how to step. I'm like, well, I already know how to step. He's like, no, this is the proper way to step. So, I mean, literally, like, we, he, he taught fundamentals. And that's why when you teach fundamentals and you have hard practices, games were easy. You, you, any player who played for Lou Holtz will tell you that our practices are harder than our games. Mm. We enjoyed playing the games. <laughs> we knew we were going to win. We, we, we walked in and knew we were going to win. And we knew that they didn't practice as, as hard as we did, guaranteed. Yeah. He taught me that you need strong fundamentals in order to be successful. And again, that's successful in life, successful in business. You know, these, these fundamentals that I'm talking about are fundamentals that, you know, you have in your business. Fundamentals are knowing what it takes in order to be, to practice your craft, in order to be good. So you get something like, like the, like, like the person you said that, that you talked to today, the electrician, right? He, he, wanted, he wanted the end result. Yeah. He didn't want to put the hard work into it. Yep. And he was afraid. Like, like I'm surprised he let at least a day or something, you know? Right. Ooh, well, 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 not at least. Well, well, well. But that's the amazing thing. Yeah. That when, when you put, when you ask somebody to work hard in order to achieve a goal, and that, that goal is going to take some time, I'm out. Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm all right. I'll find something else to do. Well, again, what happens when people aren't looking? You know, are, are you studying? I mean, I know I had to because I, I, I was in trouble as, as a freshman, my first semester. I had to hunker down. I, I had to now be a student. I had to now study hard. I had to, to go to study table. I had to ask for tutors. I had to do all these things that no one else had to do because they had better, better fundamentals than I did. But I learned those fundamentals. So it's, again, it's the same schoolwork, business, athletics, same thing. You can't be successful if you don't have strong fundamentals. And the thing that blows me away is everybody wants to be like Mike, but they don't know what Mike put into being Mike, right? They don't know about the price. And that's anybody. Everybody wants to be like Tom Brady, but, you know, he's staying after practice for two or three hours. Who does that? Right. There was a, um, a, a, a little um, um, video of Jalen Hurts, who was the quarterback at Alabama. He transferred to Oklahoma. Okay. And he, he got drafted in the second round to Philly. And during the season, after a game, they showed him in a – in the weight room, lifting weights, doing the workout. You just played a game. Like, who does that? Like, and, and, I, told, and, I, and I sent a tweet out, not that he read it, he has like a, five million followers, but I would love to play for that type of quarterback because he's doing what Michael Jordan was doing. He's doing what these successful people are doing when no one's looking, yep. right? So I guarantee you there weren't a lot. He may be the only one. I don't know. But how many people after a game 
went to go work out for whatever reason. Probably zero. I didn't. Now, you just played a game. <laughs> exactly. I'm dead. <laughs> Maybe he felt that he didn't get enough out of the game. Whatever it was, he went to, I was like, man, I, I, I would love to play for him. I would love to allow that guy to be my quarterback. Because you know, you know, fourth and one, I don't care if you're playing Alabama, whoever you're playing, you knew that dude was going to give you 500%. You just knew it. I mean, the, the era that you played college in, the, the, the powerhouse of USC, you know, West Virginia, UCLA, it's just amazing the, the era that you, that, that you came up in. And over the years, it kind of shifted down to the, to, to US, to the SEC, right? Sure. Uh, let me ask you, at the pro level, at the pro level, same question. Which player on the Bears made the best impression upon you about how to be a professional athlete? So I'd have to say Tom Thayer. And really? It was really unique because he, well, he's currently one of the announcers for the Bears. Right. Yeah. yeah, Thayer's playbook. Yes, yes. He, he actually went to Notre Dame as well. Wow. And grew up in the Joliet area. He went to Joliet Catholic. Uh, his mom and dad were awesome. Must be. His mom just passed away a little while ago. That's where Allstott went to, right? Mike yes. Allstott. Yep. Yes. Parents are awesome people. He's an awesome guy. And when I got drafted, he kind of pulled me aside. I was like, hey, man, you know, I'm going to talk to you. So he kind of really spent time with me and gave me the ropes about being a pro and being a pro in Chicago. I'll never forget this. One thing he said was, you should never have to buy a car when you're a Chicago Bear. And I was like, what you mean? I'm like, I got some money. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go buy, buy a car tomorrow. What are you talking about? <laughs> what? Cash. <laughs> so he explained to me that, hey, and this is something small, but no one, no one told me about this. The agent didn't tell me about this. That you can barter your, the tickets you get from the Bears. There's a car dealership that would love to use those tickets. And you could trade those tickets for a car. And I was like, what? I could, what? I mean, he, and he broke it down to me. And the seven years, I actually, I didn't buy a car. So I played in, in the pros for seven years. I didn't, I didn't buy a car until after my ninth year. Holy. So I, I, I'd never had a car. Now, granted, I couldn't get a, a booming system. I couldn't do all this other stuff because they were dealer cars. I'd have to give them back after 6,000 miles. But for nine years, I never owned a car. Wow. Now, what 21-year-old brand-new professional athlete is going to say, I'm not going to buy a car. I'm going to get a dealer car that I can't do anything. I can't tint the windows. I can't put a system. <laughs> I can't do any of this stuff to it. I never had a car. I never had to pay insurance for nine years. But Tom Thayer taught me that. He's money smart. He's money well, smart. Very. And then he also talked to me about training and everything else. And he was a great player. And he has an amazing story. Um, out of Notre Dame, he got drafted by the Chicago Blitz. Mm -hmm. And when they folded, he, he, he tried out for the Bears. And there was, I think it was two weeks in between the last Chicago Blitz season and the Bears 1985 Super Bowl run. And he was on the team and he, and he was a starter. So this guy went a full Chicago Blitz season, took two weeks off and played a full NFL season. I mean, he was, he was incredible. And now, I mean, he's, he's, he looks great. I mean, he was like 275, 280 when we played and he looks great right now. I mean, he is just that type of machine. But discipline, yeah. you know, and for him to pull me aside and kind of give me these life lessons, they were important. And he also was like, man, and it's, you know, because I was trying to find some place to rent, find some place to, you know, rent for a couple months. He's like, hey, you come stay with me if you want. Who does that? <laughs> great guy. Great guy. Golden Domers and Chicago Bears take care, take care of each, take in, uh, taking care of each other. Man, it's it's amazing that you just said the two biggest players 
that gave the most impression on you both on the collegiate and pro level were offensive linemen, opposite of you on the line. That's probably so, the crap out of me, that's why. Yeah, so, so in other words, what you just basically told me, the opposition actually made you better. Oh, always. I mean, come on. I mean, right, so, so in, in order to be successful, I mean, you want to see what, what other people are doing. And nine times out of ten, that could be your opponent. Right? I mean, yep. if you want to, especially in athletics, right? Because if you're good, guess what? There's somebody out, out there that's better. Now you want to learn from them. I would. Now, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to do what they do. Perfect example. There was a when I was playing linebacker in high school, I read a, a book by Mike Singletary called Calling the Shots. And I was attracted to him because he was short. He played linebacker. Drafted when he was supposed to get drafted earlier. He didn't. He had a chip on his shoulder about that. Became one of the best linebackers to ever play the game. But he was considered undersized. So he had to work hard in order to be successful. Same thing like me. I did what he did. Everything in that book, I did what he did. And that, that made me become, who I, and fast forward a couple of years, I had a chance to meet him. So I wore number 50 in high school and in college because of my Singletary. Wow. So not only did I have a chance to play for my hometown team as a kid, I get a chance to play with my idol? <laughs> Here's a funny story. So the first game that I'm in with him, I'm in the huddle and He's calling the plan. I'm looking up and going, oh, my God, pinch me. I could die now. <laughs> it's like the best experience ever. This is awesome. So he calls the play. I line up. He says, starts yelling my name, Chris, Chris. I'm like, this is, he's getting me fired up. This is great. This is awesome. Chris, Chris. I'm like, man, this is great. Then he comes over to me and he moves me. I was in the wrong gap. <laughs> in the right gap. But I was too excited because Mike Singletary, my idol, was calling my name. I mean, it was, it's, and then I have a picture. Somebody took a picture of me and my stance, and then Michael Singletary like behind me. So I think that's yeah. really cool. Like it means it means a lot to me. Is it on your Instagram? Put it on your Instagram. Oh, I will. I will. I will. Put it, put it on your Instagram. I love to see it on your Instagram. Uh, Chris, uh, what about playing for Mike Ditka? What was your biggest impression? What was what would you say his biggest impression on you would be? I was in awe because I mean this is this is. Mike Ditka, like, there's only one Mike Ditka, and he drafted me, and I watched him as a kid. Like, there were um, these cards you can get at McDonald's if you bought like, a couple big bags or whatever. And I remember having those on my wall. Willie Galt, Mike Singletary, Richard Dent, Steve McMichael, William Perry. And so, when you have a chance to put those guys, I mean, it was an amazing experience. So when I was a senior in high school, I was at a, it was an all state banquet and Mike Ditka was the featured speaker. And the banquet was at a hotel downtown. So my mom and I got on the bus, we went down there and we we're there about a half an hour, 45 minutes early. So we're sitting in the lobby. And my mom kind of nudged me on the shoulder and says, hey, there's Mike Ditka. Like, oh, that's cool. She said, go over and say hi. What? I'm 18. I am. Really? There's, hey, there's absolutely no, I, there's no way. I do not have that type of confidence at all. <laughs> She's like, well, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm trying to pull her back and she went. I was like, oh. I was punking you. <laughs> I'm sitting there, my head down and everything. She's there talking about two minutes. And then she says, she turns around, she waves me over. I'm like, oh my God, what is she? She just embarrassed the crap out of me. So I go over there, we're talking, and I'm, I'm not saying anything because what do you say to Mike Ditka, right? I mean, please. However, toward the end of the conversation, and it was short, I said, coach, because I was going to, to Notre Dame. I said, Coach, can you please remember my name in four years because I would love to play for the Bears. Now, you know, in fact, he, he didn't remember that conversation, but it's interesting that four years later on draft day, he calls me up and says, 
Chris Zorich, how would you like to be a Chicago Bear? Oh, are you kidding me? Like, there's no, and I equated to any person, male or female, who liked an icon or had a role model or wanted to be like somebody. And you had a chance to play on that team with that person. So like everybody liked the Yankees. Everybody likes the, the Cowboys. I imagine mean, growing up loving the Cowboys. And then when you're old enough, you have a chance to be on the Cowboys. I mean, that's some like some dream shit, right? I mean, no, no one does that. Yeah. So I had a chance to not only play for my hometown team as a kid growing up. Yeah. I played with my idol, Mike Singletary, for two years. Like, what the hell? Like, that, that doesn't happen. Yep. So even if I didn't play a down, seven years in the NFL and had a chance to play with my home I had the chance to play with my hometown team and I played with my childhood hero come on blessed very what do you need in order to be successful and how long do you want to stay in that field I was fortunate enough that in my situation when I got cut by the Bears I got picked up by the Redskins two days later and then had a chance to go on to play another year. But for me, I'd already planned to go to law school and I want to do some other stuff, but football wasn't fun for me anymore because it was Chicago. And kind of like what, what I told you before about the business part. I mean, I'm playing, don't get me wrong, but I missed that part of playing for my teammate. And Sports is that important to me that the person that lining up against that that lines up on the side of you or in front of you or however it is in your team, that's the most important thing. And I kind of got jaded because all people wanted to do was get paid. I mean, there were people that faked injuries when we went to the playoffs because everybody got the same check for the first round of playoffs. And I think it was five grand or 10 grand or something like that. Oh, God. We got guys that are making $30,000, $40,000, $100,000 a game. And now they're supposed to play for five grand or 10 grand or 20 grand. There are people that weren't going to play the first round because they didn't want to risk it. And I'm like, what? What is this? Wow. Team? Wow. You know, it, it's my advice would just be to, you know, understand your role and know what you need to do in order to be successful. Now, you know, you don't have to go out and party. You don't have to go out and, do, and maybe you can, that's fine. But how long do you want to be a pro? How long do you want to be successful? You know, work hard, you know, know this is your job now and you can do other stuff, but understand. And so it was funny because a lot of people say the reason why the 85 bears why they only won one Super Bowl was because afterward, like everybody became an individual. Everybody was doing this, everybody was doing that. Like people, if you missed practice, you were fined $5,000. Well, if you had an appearance that paid you $50,000. You're good. And you're net 45. Practice, people were missing practices. And then the first people didn't, then the coach started his practices. So he was doing stuff. So now when you got a coach that doesn't go to practice. Leadership, leadership by example, man. Exactly. Leadership by example. We, we always say I'm busy. You know, you, 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 your guys will do half of what you do right and twice what you do wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Right? If you haven't bought any whiskey yet, please buy it. Uncle there Dave's whiskey, all right? Well, hey, let, let's, let's talk about that for a second now. So, yeah, okay, sure. Actually, I, I kind of, um, I saw there was an article a long time ago. I didn't see the original one. And I forgot the woman's name, but she, she did the article in the New York Times. On Weaver. Yes. And that got a little exposure. And I think I saw like the following year and I was like, Jack Daniels, I love Jack Daniels. Why did I never knew about this? Yeah did all this research and, and knew and found out that to my knowledge, 
you know, the company never denied that Nearest didn't do it. Matter of fact, I was, again, from reading, his name was, you know, in the lore, you know, his name is on a tour and everything else. But it was amazing that no one knew. And it was interesting because I saw her in an interview, I think it was in New York, and the, she was on, a, it was a radio interview. And the radio, I forgot who it was, but he was calling up, oh yeah, you know, Uncle Tom, and he was a slave. And she was like, well, hold on, time out, time out. You don't know anything about the situation. It actually, that didn't happen. He was, he made a lot of money. He was well off. The family was very well in that community. And it was just past slavery. So, you know, this interpretation of, hey, there was a black person who used the, um, the distilling process that he learned from, I think, the Caribbean. I don't, I'm not sure where he's from. But, you know, people think, oh, well, he was a slave. And he wasn't. And so the fact that she brought this back, again, to my knowledge, she purchased a distillery yep. and a whiskey. And she's like uh, uh, an award-winning author. Like, this is great. Yep. So that's literally as much. And she wrote the new forward in the autobiography of, of Jack Daniels, which I have. That's awesome. So yeah, that's so much I know. But. Yeah. <laughs> And I know you're an investor, so from now on, dude, you got to send me a couple of cases, man. You got it, bro. Hundred percent, bro. It's it's it. And uh, but my my sister, um, so so we had the, so when I went to high school, well, military. Well, when my sister left high school, she went to work. She went to uh, junior college, but a year after that, she went for because my sister loved dance. She was like a dance ballet, okay. jazz. All that. So she go. She went. She got a job for Disney. She went to go work at Orlando. Work in Orlando. Lived in Kissimmee and. 18, 19 years old, that's what my sister was doing. And she tried out for the Orlando Magic, became an Orlando Magic girl. And fast forward, she wanted to move to LA. She wanted to be a Laker girl. But instead of finding, finding a job with the Lakers, she found Jesus, okay. right? She started working for the church. And, uh, and my, my sister's been an ama amazing connection. So my sister connected with my now current mentor, the CEO of PHP agency, Patrick Ben David. Okay. Because her pastor says, hey, Sapala, you need to meet, you need to meet the Iranian version of you. Right? So what are you talking about? He's like, you guys are over six feet tall. You guys are both from different countries and you're former military and you're in finance. Really interesting. And he tells Patrick the same thing. Hey, you need me the Filipino version of you over six feet tall, <laughs> blah, 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 right? And so fast forward, look, look, look at the synergy he and I have created you know, thus far. It's just amazing connection. The next connection I sister made, hey, hey Kuya, which means older brother in Filipino. Hey Kuya, I want you to meet Fawn Weaver. Right, and so Fawn Weaver. Uh, matter of fact, she's like the godparent, in case something uh, happens to my sister and brother-in-law in LA, because that's where they currently live. Wow, she's the first to go in there. Right, so Fawn has got she's tight with with my sister. So they, they were the first investors in. Uh, they were the first investors in in, in Uncle Nearest. That's uh, awesome. I just happened to be on the back end conversation of being an investor in in, in Uncle Nearest and. And, uh, you know, military, we drink, we drink a lot of Jack Daniels and Coke. So, <laughs> hey, man. Hey, I got, I got, well, I got this and I have this. So, and I'm not yeah. even military. So, I, I wanted to ask you about transition because a lot, a lot of guys that watch my YouTube channel, watch, that follow me on Facebook here are also military veterans. You know, they're leaving, they're leaving the, uh, the Marine Corps, leaving the Army, leaving the Navy, transitioning out into the, the regular world. Some of the guys I, that follow me are also are, are athletes and guys that never made it to the league, but they made it to D1, but never got drafted and they never made it to the next area in their sport like, like, like you have. So, so the point is, for that period of time where they're either in college or when they're in the military, it's almost kind of like a bubble where, where they, got, they got significant. They were significant in the rank, they were significant on campus, and they, they're significant in a pro team. And now, boom, it's done. Healthcare is gone, insurance, finances, stature, maybe even respect, I don't know. Sure. What, what, what's, what would you say is that next move? You, you're in transition or you just got laid off. For somebody watching right now, your, your job furloughed you or your job laid you off. Your job says, you know, we, you know the coronavirus, we, we're never opening our doors again. And they attach their identity to that job right. title. 
Well, the first thing is that you should, you should always have a plan, right? So, you know, for me being a professional athlete, I knew as soon as I stepped on that field, as soon as I got drafted, I knew it wasn't going to last forever. Now, I had great influencers. I had great role models. I had great mentors that made me understand that. But have a plan. And this is military. This is everything, right? Because what happens is, and for professional athletes, the, the phrase is you, you stop hearing the cheers. Right, you stop that that folks wanting to be associated with you. Um, the fans are no longer there, and it's hard. And military is different, although it's challenging. But for such a long period of time, since you were a kid, in some cases, yeah, people adored you. You got special treatment. So their kids get special treatment in grammar school. They go to high school, get special treatment. They go to college, get special treatment. Go to the pros, get special treatment. Then all of a sudden, let's say you have a 10-year pro career. Then you're done. You walk out that door for the last time. No one's clapping. Yeah. No one's yelling your name. I mean, and that's why a lot of, a lot of professional athletes have a lot of issues dealing with that. And I know the NFL has a program to assist Wow. Transition out. Wow. Hard. I mean, think about, you know, people, I mean, I mentioned before, you know, front of the line, free food, you know, great, great book, great opportunities. When all that's gone, what happens? You know, and, and if, if, you're, if your self-worth is tied into that, that's another aspect. I mean, you know, you're, you're this great person, this great player, but no you as a person you walk out the door how does that affect you mentally yeah you know i mean you want you go to a crowd you go to a game no one's yelling your name they're yelling somebody else's name i used to be the man here you know what's going on so in order to transition you should have a plan and i was fortunate enough that i knew that football wasn't the end-all be-all for me so i was making a plan to go to law school so oftentimes what you'll find with professional athletes is if you leave on your own terms, you can handle that transition a lot better, right? So if you get cut, you, you get your knee blown out, something happens, you never play again after that, you didn't leave on your own terms. You, feel you still had something left. Mm -hmm. That's a hard transition. Because you go from being everybody yelling your name to, hey, no, you have to get at the end of the line. You're not used to that. I mean, you're used to first class, you're used to, you know, up front. What is this? So it's a hard transition. But in order to combat that, I'm not saying making a plan is perfect, but at least you have a chance to make that transition on your own. At least you have something to do when you walk away. Like oftentimes now the NFL has set up a program where if you didn't get your degree, you can go to certain schools around the country and go back to school, which was just helpful, right? Because you're going to need something. Because if you, if you played and leave for three or four years, don't have a degree, who's going to hire you? Or they're going to look at your resume and say, hey, you were in school for six years, didn't get a degree. Why would I want to hire you? Yeah. Now I'm not saying you don't need you. I'm I'm not saying you need a degree to succeed. What I'm saying is you had an opportunity to get one. You didn't get one. Why is that? Oh, I play football. Well, that's not the answer I want to hear. As an employer, why didn't you get your degree? You had six years. You had five years. So that's why they're helping players go back, get their degrees. But making that that transition is hard. Have a plan. Make sure that you have a support staff around you. And again, this goes back to on, on the, the professional ranks. If you're, you know, working with someone, if when your career is over, that person divorces you or leaves you, now what? Yeah. I mean, it's rough, man. And, and it happens to a lot of guys. Hmm. Now, Chris, the flip side to that, 
What happens if you got caught with your pants down? You didn't have a plan. Then what? Who do I, who do I, who do you connect with? Well, What's hopefully you have resources. Hopefully you didn't blow all your money. Hopefully you have friends. Um, and, and the, the NFL players association is really, um, they're doing a lot better in the past. When you were, when you walked away from the game, they didn't care about you. Now, now we do, but you have to come up with a plan. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. Now, hopefully your career ended abruptly. Hopefully you saved a little money. Hopefully you can use that properly. Um, hopefully you can use that toward an education, investment, entrepreneur, do whatever it is. But if your career stops when you weren't expecting it, regroup. Go on those fundamentals that you know. You know, let it, if it's not football, it's something else. If it's not sports, it's something else. And if it has nothing to do with sports, just go back to what you know. And if it's something that, if it's a trade you need to relearn, go relearn it. Hey, you know, you're in a position, you may, if you're um, uh, a teacher, you get laid off, you always want to be a lawyer, go to law school. I know it's not that easy, believe me, but it's making sure that if you don't have a plan, get a plan, start one, make sacrifices, meet new people. I mean, the idea of being alone in the situation is rough especially during these times, right? I mean, we talk about people quarantine and you're about to lose your job. If you don't have any family, you're sitting in your apartment, your house by yourself, what do you do? Yeah. Regroup, this is a great time, great time now. You're by yourself, reassess. Think about what you can do. What do you do great? What do you do best? What do you want to do? You may be older. You may be close to retirement. Well, if you are, find something that you love. I mean, imagine if, and I forgot what the saying is, but something like, it's not work if you love what you're doing. I mean, how many of those, how many of us are in a position where we don't like our jobs, right? Yep. yep. I mean, find, in order, and then how, how are you affected by that? All you're doing is now is a paycheck. Well, yeah, you got bills to pay, but are you happy? You get older, all of a sudden you start reassessing. Man, is this where my life wanted to be? Go back to those fundamentals. Do, know, do what you know. What did you go to school for? What do you know? Who do you know? Swallow some of that pride. Do something that you may not have want, you may not want to do, but you got to do something. You can't just sit there because there's thousands and thousands of people that are. And what was it, 30, 30 people? In the earth, excuse me, 30 million people in the country um, are on unemployment. Okay, you can either take that as a positive or a negative, right? If you're one of the unemployed, think about, okay, cool, you know what? There's a lot of jobs out there. And if we're coming down this pandemic, get your resume together. Go out there, I mean, go in a field that you may not be used to. It's, you, you can, I hate to sound, so I hate to say this, but this could be an opportunity for you. Being in a worse position might be an opportunity because everything's cleared out. And the benefit to transitioning to something else or finding that passion and interest is greater now today because the world is on pause. Sure. The world is on pause. So, you know, Chris, man, I really appreciate you just hang with me tonight, man. Smoking a stogie. Absolutely, man. Drinking some Uncle Nears whiskey. Hey, man. Tell me, man. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my cases, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to give him bennies on my money. <laughs> Chris, you've been so generous with your time. I appreciate the conversation. Please tell Candy. We said thank, I said thank you to her. And uh, a little bit. I, I, I cheer, but I ran out of whiskey. I got to go get oh, another. Oh, <laughs> man. Come on, man. How you doing a whiskey show with no whiskey? And you're an investment. You should have this like a case. Next time, you just have cases behind you when you do the show next time. There you go. Free yeah. advertisement. Awesome. All right, folks, thanks for joining us. If you have been watching this on Facebook, please like our business page. Make sure you like Chris, the official Chris Zorch page too as well on Facebook. If you're watching this on YouTube, 
Make sure you click like, hit notification, be alerted next time we upload an episode just like this. Love to know your thoughts. Love to know your comments. Love to know your feedback. Let me know how you're reinventing yourself during this quarantine life, during this pandemic, this lockdown, because as Chris mentioned earlier, this is the time right now to look at something that's going to drive you, separate you. may not even be something that you ever considered and thought about doing, but get that done to reignite that productivity with inside you. And for those of you who are froggy enough, if you want to be the Michael Jordan of your sport, work on the fundamentals and, and perform when nobody's watching. Absolutely. Right. That being said, thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Chris. Yes, sir. And, uh, and I always say this, man, as, as I close off every episode, until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, be money smart today. God bless you guys. Stay healthy and stay safe. Chris, appreciate you, brother. You got it, man. Thank you.